Lots of people ask me what it takes to get started foraging and how to safely identify wild edibles. So today we're going to take a look at that. Before we gallop out into the wild and start cramming our faces full of delicious wild foods, would you like to play a game? Here are some leaves I picked from four different plants, which I found all within walking distance of my house. One or more of these plants is edible and delicious. One or more of them is deadly poisonous. Let's have a look at them all individually, then if you want you can pause the video and post a comment with your guess as to whether each one, numbered 1 to 4, is delicious or deadly. Before I tell you the answers, let's talk about why these plants look similar to each other. They are all members of the botanical family Apiaceae, or in common language, the celery and carrot family. Because this family contains celery, carrots and parsnips, but also parsley, fennel and dill, as well as some spices like cumin, coriander and caraway. A lot of the plants in this family have flowers arranged in this conspicuous flattish or sometimes rounded umbrella-like clusters called umbels. In fact, this family used to be called Umbelliferae before it was renamed Apiaceae. They often also have this sort of feathery leaf arrangement that is called pinnate, in some cases bipinnate or tripinnate, where the leaves branch off the stems, then themselves branch into leaflets, which again branch into smaller leaflets, sort of fractal in nature. So these four specimens all look kind of similar, don't they? Apart from this one maybe, which has bigger and simpler leaves, but that's mostly a simple matter of scale. When you compare these leaves to the other ones zoomed in, you can see the similarity. OK, so time for the answers to our little game, and how confident are you that you guessed them right? Let's start with this one. It's called cow parsley, or sometimes wild chervil. It's a very, very common plant, found in hedgerows, roadsides, pastures and open woodland. Here's what it looks like when it's growing. The young leaves are edible and have a taste that is described as like strong parsley with a hint of carrot. I've never eaten it myself, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. This one here looks quite similar, doesn't it? You might have seen me mention this in previous videos. It's called hemlock water dropwort, and it's deadly poisonous. In fact, one of the most toxic plants in Great Britain. The most common cases of poisoning involve the fleshy roots, which look a bit like parsnips, and people have mistaken them for such. But all parts of this plant are poisonous. The toxin in this plant causes death by muscle constriction. All of your muscles contract. Your heart is made of muscles. Your ribcage and diaphragm use muscles to enable you to breathe. So if all of those muscles all constrict and stay constricted, it's bad. In the final stages of poisoning, the muscles of the face will constrict. So, hey, at least you die with a smile. Love that joker. Here's what it looks like when it's growing. It's often found on riverbanks, swamps and other damp places. Oh look, right nearby, there's cow parsley. Now, where were we? Oh yeah, that's hemlock water dropwort. Hemlock. Familiar, right? But this isn't the same poison hemlock that famously killed Socrates. No, no, no. That's a different species of plant altogether. In fact, it's this one right here. Yep, this is poison hemlock. Also known as poison parsley, this right here is the hemlock that killed Socrates. And although these plants are all related, this one kills in a different way. It contains an alkaloid that interferes with the central nervous system, typically causing paralysis. Your muscles don't get the signals to tell them to move, including those muscles in your ribcage and diaphragm. They stop moving, so you stop breathing, which is kind of a bad thing to do. This is what poison hemlock looks like when it's growing, here in a roadside hedgerow. Oh look, there's cow parsley growing right alongside poison hemlock. Chances of death by misadventurous foraging here are pretty high. And finally, this one here is called ground elder or goutweed. It's got broader, simpler leaves than the others, and it typically forms a low-growing layer of ground cover, like you see here. Oh look, there's cow parsley again. Anyway, ground elder is edible and quite delicious. The young leaves have a mild flavour that's something like a blend of carrot, parsley and celery, I think. 
I pick this plant quite often, either as a green vegetable in its own right, or just to chop and use in any recipe that calls for parsley. That's why I don't bother with cow parsley. I'm confident that I could differentiate it from its deadly lookalikes, but there's just no need to. If I want a leafy, parsley, carrot-flavoured wild vegetable, ground elder is my go-to. So there we are. These two plants are lovely. These two are lethal. And yet, okay, leaving ground elder aside for a moment and just looking at these three, they are alarmingly similar, don't you think, especially once picked like this. In the face of what I've just shown you, it might seem like it's completely hopeless or that foraging for wild edible plants is just a massive gamble with very high stakes. Well, it needn't be. And the reason for that is the same reason that I was able to tell you which of these plants is which in that last segment. Put simply, it's possible to conclusively identify plants and by doing so, be 100% certain that you're eating something safe and avoiding poisonous things. We'll come back to the differentiating features of these four plants a bit later in the video after I talk about how to get started. I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's not impossible either, and achieving it is really just a matter of honing the skill of identifying things in nature. And for that reason, the approach I strongly recommend for anyone wanting to get started is to set aside the foraging books for a moment and just put a pin in the idea about skipping out into the fields to start eating things. To learn to forage, you first have to resist the urge to eat things and focus on identifying them. And for this, the reference materials designed for that purpose, identifying, are usually a better place to start than the books about foraging, which are often more about the culinary properties of those things. So I suggest you need a few things to get started. Firstly, a pocket-sized field guide to plants and flowers. It absolutely needs to be one that's relevant to your region because plants are not the same in all parts of the world. Also, a more comprehensive reference guide is useful, again, specific to your region. This sort of book will contain a lot more detail about the features of the plants, their habitats, distribution, and other interesting facts. I usually leave the big book at home, but you could carry it in a bag or something if you want. It's worth taking a magnifying glass, unless you already have amazing eyesight. I don't. Although you might be able to get by taking macro photos on a smartphone and then zooming in on those to look at fine details. Apart from that, all you need is stuff like sensible shoes and clothing, a drink and some snacks, maybe a sunblock and a hat, and get out into nature and start trying to match things you find with things in your field guide. The smaller guides typically have one picture of a typical specimen and a brief description of the plant in general, but there's actually more information here than meets the eye. You might have to leaf all the way through your book for every specimen at first, but after a while you'll start to notice some patterns, and the most significant one of these is plant families. Have you ever noticed that a sunflower looks a bit like a really big daisy? The reason for that is that a sunflower is a really big daisy. Daisies and sunflowers are related to one another. They're members of the family Asteraceae, which used to be called Compositae, and if you're using an older field guide, which is perfectly okay to do, the names have changed, the plants mostly haven't, it might only mention Compositae, not Asteraceae. Your field guide is most likely to be organised by those botanical families, so if you find a flower that looks a bit daisy-like, you need to flip to the pages where the daisy family is grouped, and you'll have already narrowed down your search by a whole lot. By the way, it's vastly easier to identify plants when they're flowering, so start with the ones that are doing that. The similarities between related plants aren't always as obvious as they are between daisies and sunflowers, but a lot of them are. Here are a few examples. The family Brassicaceae contains cabbages, mustards, radishes, turnips and others. The petals of the flowers usually look a bit like this. In fact, this family used to be called Cruciferi because of the cross-shaped arrangement of the flowers. Here's a species of mustard. Here's cuckoo flower. Here's a garden wallflower. Four petals in a cross shape. Next we've got the family Lamiaceae, the mint family. A lot of culinary herbs come from this family, including mint, sage, thyme, oregano, basil, as well as a lot of flowering garden favourites like lavender, salvias and catnip. This family has flowers that are typically like a tube or cone, opening to what's been described as lip-like structures. Often the lower one's sort of splayed out like an apron, and usually the upper one curves over a bit like a hood. Here's white dead nettle, rosemary and ground ivy. The pea family, Fabiaceae, typically has flowers that look a bit like this. Sometimes they're really easy to see, as in this example, which is common vetch, or this, which is gorse. Or in the case of clover, the flowers are tiny and grouped together in a cluster like this, but when you look really closely, they have that pea flower look to them. Anyway, hopefully you get the idea. Using your field guide, look at the shape of the leaves, the edges of the leaves, for example, are they smooth or toothed, the pattern of veins or wrinkles in the leaves, the arrangement of leaves on the stem, the presence or absence of hairs or thorns, the colours of the leaves, stems and flowers and so on. If your book is like mine and it's illustrated with paintings rather than photographs, every detail of those paintings is there for a reason. It's there to help you identify the plant. If possible, take some good photos of the specimens you study and compare them with the big book back home. It's probably better to take photos than pick specimens, just because photos won't shrivel on the way home. And anyway, at this stage, if you can't identify a thing, there's always next time. And that's all you need to do, or rather keep doing. 
At first, it will seem really difficult, but with practice, you get to the point where you'll be saying, oh, that's something in the mustard family. And then later, oh, there's cuckoo flower. It stops being a mystery and just becomes something you can do. And at that point, when you can identify a plant with clear certainty, it's time to think about getting out those books on foraging again. You'll probably find the identifying information in there very familiar, albeit often simpler than your other reference materials. But you can, of course, cross-reference them by species names. And the foraging books will tell you which plants you can eat and how to enjoy them. And helpfully, the foraging guides are usually very good about flagging up any potential mishaps. For example, here's a page about cow parsley, which we were looking at right at the beginning of the video. And that same page warns about similarity to poison hemlock and hemlock water dropwort and gives you clear instruction on how to differentiate them. So in a moment, I'll take you out in the field and we'll go and identify a few plants using my field guide. But first, let's take a really quick look at the differentiating features of those four plants we looked at at the start of the video. Cow parsley has stems that are green or purple, and it's fairly solid blocks of colour or smooth gradients between those colours. Larger stems are kind of grooved like celery, and might be green with longitudinal purple stripes. The stems and leaf stalks are hairy, or actually minutely bristly. It's a slender, wiry sort of plant, and often it'll be found in sprawling masses. It usually grows to about a metre tall. Poison hemlock has stems that are smooth, with no grooves or ridges, and they're bright green splashed with sort of purple blotches. It's also a more robust and upright plant than cow parsley, and it grows quite tall, often exceeding two metres when fully grown. Hemlock water dropwort has stems that are ridged, so it has that in common with cow parsley, but unlike cow parsley, hemlock water dropwort stems are hairless. In fact, the whole plant is, and it's a fresh, vibrant green colour throughout. These, of course, aren't the only differences, and your reference materials should provide plenty of information for telling one thing from another. And there's always a way to tell the differences. I mean, technically, that's not completely true. There will be cases where the exact identification of a plant requires a microscope or laboratory tests. But those really fine divisions are usually about differentiating two very similar and related subspecies or varieties. That's interesting to botanists, but not so relevant to the amateur naturalist. Those kind of subtle, barely perceptible differences don't divide between edible and non-edible. OK, enough theory. Let's go over to foraging shrimp somewhere outdoors and look at how we do this identification thing in actual practice. Thank you, Studio Shrimp. Well, we're here in a bit of local woodland and not very far at all from civilization, so don't be surprised if you hear the sound of lawnmowers or people walking dogs or that sort of thing. But we're going to have a wander through here and see if we can find some plants to identify today. So we've already identified this plant in the intro to this video. And I just want to go over it again. This is hemlock water dropwort. We looked at it earlier in the video. It was one of our four plants to be identified. And you can see here, because this plant has grown up a little bit since I last took video of it, you can see the umbel starting to form there. The flower structure that's very characteristic of this family of plants. But we're not so interested in that plant today. We're going to go and find some other things to look at. Now it is probably worth noting that since this is my local area there aren't that many plants here that I haven't seen before or that I haven't been able to recognize so I'm kind of pretending that I'm encountering these plants for the very first time most of these plants that we're going to look at today I have already identified because I'm familiar with them they grow near me so I know what they are but I'm going to try and approach it as if I'm encountering them the first time like you would if you've not done this well, here's an interesting plant down here, the one with the purple flowers. But it's in a rather precarious position, so I think we'll probably try and find a slightly more amenable specimen for careful examination. Okay, and here it is. So, what have we got? We've got a bush-like plant that is perhaps 75 centimetres tall, maybe almost a metre tall in the tallest parts. It's got spear-shaped leaves with conspicuous veining and I can tell just from touching them they've got a kind of felty, bristly, furry texture to them. We've got clusters of purple flowers which are kind of nodding in their habit and they're little bell-shaped things. So look at those flowers, they're like little bells. Okay, so that's a fair bit of observation about the plant. Let's get the book out and see if we can find it. In the front of my book, there's a kind of index that 
gives you rough, a rough idea of the plant families and the types. So I'm going to try to use that. So I'm looking for something with kind of bell-shaped flowers. I don't see anything here actually. So it might be a case of leafing right the way through the book. So we'll do that now. And it should be fairly easy to spot what I'm looking at because conspicuous purple flowers in clusters that have got a kind of nodding habit to them. There's something with a nodding purple flower but definitely not what we saw. There's another purplish flower, but that's going singly on a very slender stalk. Those are all pea flowers, and it definitely wasn't a pea flower that we saw. I'll keep going. Those are all umbellifers, which, again, not what we saw. Oh, right, so we've got some bell-shaped flowers here, but very different leaves. So those are heathers. Uh, we've got some bell-shaped flowers here, but they're kind of upright, and the leaves are very different as well, again, sort of narrow, grassy sort of leaves there. Ah, right, okay. So here we go. So we've got some bell-shaped flowers in clusters, white ones there. Okay, so this one here, number one and number two. So, okay, common comfrey and Russian comfrey. So let's read the description. So, tall marsh and waterside plant, well, we're near water, has tubular flowers of creamy white or mauve. Ah, so this one here has variable colored flowers. Not shown in my picture, but I suppose they're gonna be a bit like that. Okay, tubular flowers of creamy white or mauve. Its leaves run down the stems as far as the next leaf junction. We didn't look for that. So we'll go back and have a look at that in a moment. Doesn't really say an awful lot here, but the category description here says most plants of the borage family are hairy, often roughly so. Their five petal flowers are often pink in bud. Right, not a great deal of description there, but that's a pretty good candidate. Look at the leaves, they're quite similar. Spear-shaped leaves with conspicuous veining. Let's go back and have a look and see if the leaf stalks do run right down the stem. So here's that plant again, and yeah, look at this. So we've got the base of the leaf there does indeed join the stem, and it runs all the way down to the next node. Can you see that? There's like a wing on the stem there. You can actually see there's a bit of leaf there that's stuck to the stem almost. Oops, sorry, B. So I've already identified with fair certainty that this is probably a comfrey. This is probably a species of comfrey. Now, spoilers, I already know it is. This is common comfrey. It's got purplish flowers, although actually, interestingly, the flowers can be white, pink, purple, sometimes almost like navy blue. So there we go, common comfrey, and we identified it from the book. Let's go and find something else to look at. Okay, right down here, near where I was sitting with the book just now, we've got a low-growing, almost clover-like plant. See how these, it's got these little trefoil leaves, which remind me a lot of clover. But this is not clover, because look at those flowers, they're different. So, let's get a close look at those flowers. And when I look at them really, really closely, yeah, I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but I can tell those are little pea flowers. You can see the shape of the flower is like, a, like the pea flowers that we looked at earlier. It's got trefoil leaves. Each of the leaves is marked with a little kind of reddish-brown chevron. The other thing to note about here is that unlike clover, they're kind of almost like little, well, they're little clusters of maybe five or six flowers. Anyway, let's get the book out, see if we can find it. Okay, so this time I've got a hunch that this is a pea flower. So I'm going to jump straight to the section of my book that's about pea flowers, which is page 36. And we're going to start there. We might still be wrong, but it's a good place to start. So I've got a bunch of things here which are pea flowers. Most of these have got pinnate leaves or they're tall slender things or that one's spiny. That's gorse. So it doesn't look like there's anything on that page. Here 
all purple and pink flowers, probably not any of these. And again, lots of pinnate leaves here and viney type of things. Right, so now we're getting somewhere. We've got all the clovers over here. We've got trefoil leaves. And down here, we've got a bunch of trefoil type things with yellow pea flowers. And in fact, there's one I can see there. It's got little chevrons on the leaves, like we saw. Interestingly, I didn't notice when we were looking at it whether the edges of the leaves were toothed. But we'll have a look at that again in a moment. So this one here, we've got toothed leaves. It's got small, loose clusters of yellow pea flowers. It does look like a good candidate. So number nine, which is Spotted Medic, it's called. Has only a few flowers in each head. Its pods are spiny and spirally coiled. There's usually a dark spot on each leaflet. So let's go back and have a look at this plant because we're going to have a look and see, are the leaves actually toothed on the fringes there, especially on the, on the far end from the stalk? And so yes, when we look at this plant, we can see, and I'll put, some, I'll put the book behind it so we've got a bit of contrast on the leaves. You can see there is a kind of toothed look to the ends of the leaves. So I think what we've got here is Spotted Medic. Let's see if we can find a seed pod, because the book did say something about spirally coiled seed pods. We might be a little bit early in the year for finding any seeds on here. It does look like it. But I think that's Spotted Medic. So let's look for one more plant to identify. It's quite lovely here in this little meadowy bit here. Let's have a look along here. So there's more of this purple comfrey here common comfrey. You can see this one. I don't know if you can see it very well on the camera. This one's quite a lot more purple than the first specimen we looked at. And we've got more hemlock water dropwort growing through the back here. And again you can see those umbel flowers starting to develop there. Okay, one more plant and then we'll head back to the studio. And again, just to kind of underline the point, which I probably have laboured a bit too much in this video about poisonous plants growing next to non-poisonous plants, we've got here hemlock water dropwort growing mixed with cow parsley. So if I was just to go in here and grab bunches of leaves, I could take a handful from there, and that handful contains cow parsley and hemlock water dropwort. Delicious, deadly. Right, here's one we can look at. There's a lot of this little pink flower growing in the grass here. Tiny, tiny little pink flower. So let's get a close look at it. Okay, this is a nice specimen here. So we've got flowers that are pink with, well, it looks like 10 petals, but in fact, there are five petals and they're kind of divided. So yeah, it's actually got five petals, but each of the petals has got a big tooth cut in the end. So it's like a, almost like a 10 petal plant, but it's not, it's five petals with a notch in the end. Each of the petals has got a little stripe on it. Let's have a look at the leaves. The leaves are like little circles that have been cut at the edges. They're kind of like little hands actually, aren't they? Little palms. I think that's this form of leaf is called palmate. And yeah, so they're, they're like little starburst type of things. They're soft and felty. So this is actually a very tiny little plant, and this is one of those situations where your hand lens, well, if you can see that, will get you a better view of those flowers. Certainly for my eyesight, something like that is necessary to get a real full appreciation of what those flowers look like. So rather than kneeling down there in the wet grass, let's go and find somewhere to sit down. This looks good. Let's get the book out and we'll have a quick look. So again, we're going to use the index here and see if there's any shortcuts. Okay, that's a good candidate there. Five petals, but no notches on the ends of the petals. Let's see if we can see anything that's a better candidate. No, I think, well, maybe we'll start there. 44. Pheasant in the background. Oh, hang on. Well, we landed on page 43 completely by accident. And actually, I've got here what I think might be a good set of candidates. We've got some pink petals here with notches in the ends of them and similar sort of leaves to what I saw there. So I think what we're looking at here, well let's have a look. So I'd say that's probably the best candidate. Number two there which is Dove's Foot Cranesbill. 
So it's so we've got to read the whole description. So the Cranesbill family has flowers with prominent stamens and fruits that end in a long pointed beak, whence the name. Most of them grow in grassy places, check. Hedgerow Cranesbill, Geranium Pyrenaicum, grows especially on waysides. It has leaves cut only to halfway. Dove's Foot Cranesbill, Geranium Molle, is much smaller with rounded leaves, check. Starting to flower in April, and then small flowered cranesbill is similar with smaller lilac flowers. Well, that's not that. I think we've got dove's foot cranesbill here. I think that's a close match. The flowers look right, the stem looks right, the leaves look right. Let's see if we can find any of those seed pods. Let's get a really close look at that. So, there they are, the little seed pods with a beak on the end. So, that's definitely a cranesbill. So there we go, three fairly reliable identifications we've just made. I'm going to take some really good photos of those plants. I'll take them back home, I'll compare them against the big book, and we'll get a better idea of how reliable we are. But I'm very confident that we got them in the right families, and in fact the right genus as well. So I think we're down to the species level now with those three plants. They might be a slightly different species, so that might be a slightly different species of Gumfrey, a slightly different species of Medic, and a slightly different species of Geranium over there but I'm very confident that we got close and the big book will get us even closer if we need to, if we're not already spot on. So that's all of the outdoor bit for today. I'm going to hand you back now to Studio Shrimp. Thanks Foraging Shrimp. So that isn't the whole journey, but in a nutshell, that's how to get you started. I know it's probably going to be a disappointment to some that this isn't just a case of learning a handful of simple rules then filling the basket with food. There are things out there that can kill you and other things that are delicious and nutritious, and some of them look quite similar to each other, so it's always a case of conclusively identifying the thing in front of you. That identification will tell you whether it's edible or not. If you can't identify it, you can still be perfectly safe by simply not picking it and not eating it. This is a finite skill that can be learned, and I think it's worth learning just because for me it has deepened my appreciation of the natural world around me, because you have to look very closely at things. You get to see intricacy and beauty that was hidden to your eye as you just wandered past beforehand. So I hope that's been interesting and I hope this has encouraged you rather than dissuaded you to take a closer look at nature and understand it better. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.